And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Amanda, who during her near-death experience felt like she returned home, and today we're going to learn about it. Amanda, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Thank you. Well, Amanda, if you don't mind, let's just start on the day that it happened and go from there. Sure. So on the day that it happened, I was a passenger in a car driving on a high mountain road. And the road was like, say the road was here. And then the mountain went pretty much straight up like that. And then over here, there was a guardrail, cement guardrail, and then a drop. And so what I remember happening was an oncoming car lost control and swerved into our lane and was headed straight for us. And the driver of my car swerved onto the shoulder to try and avoid that car. And <clears throat> when we swerved onto the shoulder and hit the gravel and then swerved back on the road, our car lost control and it started spinning. And we didn't hit that oncoming car, but we hit another car that was behind him because we got in the wrong lane. And then our car flipped upside down <clears throat> and landed upside down, like with the roof crushed, right on that concrete metal barrier. So the front of our car was like over the edge. So when we did open our eyes, we were looking at like upside down evergreen trees going straight down. And then the back side of the car was on the roadside. And at first, at the end of the accident, there was like, just kind of like a little bit of movement while the car was resting. And I just remember the last part, like we still weren't sure that like, even if we moved a little bit, we might like rock it, you know, over the edge. That was the, the facts, the material world facts of the car accident. And <clears throat> what happened for me was its own story. So when our car lost control, the minute it lost control, I had this, I had this sense in that split second, we're going over the edge. And that probably came from, um, I had been working as a paramedic for a long time in an area not too far away from here. And we used to make a joke that all the paramedics that worked on this stretch of highway, they had very little experience because all of the car accidents that happened would just go over the edge. They never met their patients. It was just death, death, death. And so when we lost control, I just was like, okay, this is my time. <laughs> and as soon as that split second happened, for me, time completely slowed down. So even though the actual events of the car accident were like, you know, probably a few seconds, for me, I closed my eyes, I leaned back in my seat, and I literally prepared to die peacefully and really just let go. And I started to, the first thing I remember was starting to lose my sense of hearing. I Everything just kind of got very silent as though there were earplugs being put on. After that, it felt like lifting out of my body into this vast, vast darkness. And when I say darkness, it wasn't dark as though it was frightening or ominous or a void-like place at all. What it was like was this, it had the feeling of being pillowy, kind of feathery, soft. And I noticed right away as well that for the first time in my conscious memory, I didn't have a body 
I didn't have any heaviness. I didn't have any anxiety. I didn't have any tension. And there was this total lightness that I'm even having trouble to like describe properly right now because we're all so used to being in our body. So suddenly I'm not there in my body anymore. And the only way I could kind of liken it is if you have a really vivid dream, you're, you know, you're in your dream, you're having the experience, but you don't feel heaviness because it's just, you're just in this like zone of awareness. So it was like that, but it wasn't like a dream as far as the reality of it. There was nothing dreamlike about it. It was, it was more real than the material world. And so the time just seemed to stop while I kind of hovered, hovered here. And I didn't really have an awareness or uh, yeah, any attention on earth. I wasn't thinking about the accident or my life or anything like that. I was so mesmerized by the, just the ability to be lingering in this really soft place. And the next thing that I remember happening was this feeling of familiarity. And, you know, I have a great family. I grew up in a lovely home. Um, like there's familiarity on earth. But to me, this was like the familiarity of eons. There was like a an ancient feeling to it. Like, like I'd spent like a millisecond with my family and my home and my life on earth as far as like 1% familiarity, this was like 100% familiarity. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, oh, I'm back, (laughs) finally. And even though I say finally, I didn't know that I was waiting to get back till I got back. And even now I just, I like have chills in my body just remembering that moment of realizing where I found myself. And it was so cool to find myself back home or at maybe the threshold of home when I wasn't even looking for it so like you know when you're going on a trip home um after being away for a long journey there's like this build up and you're thinking about it and you're excited it was like damn I was just there so I didn't even have like a, a, a build up and then the next thing I remember happening was realizing that home wasn't it wasn't an actual place it was like it was like it was like there was like a presence and it's kind of like I guess if if someone is in the next room in your house and you don't see or hear them but you saw them five minutes ago and you know for sure they're in the next room there's kind of like just a knowing a presence so it started to be like that it's like oh I'm not alone here there's like a presence all around me And this presence, I started to realize, knows me, knows me so well, knows me more than (laughs) like the human version of me knows myself, knows about all the different lives I've ever lived. And there was this tone of like a curious grandfather, you know, when you, you haven't seen your grandfather in a while and you come to visit and he wants to hear, you know, about all the adventures you've been on. There was like a fascination and a curiosity um, as this presence started to kind of like telepathically interface with me. And I could tell that this presence was just as excited to see me as I was to be there. There was like this mutual building of like, you know, it's been, it's been so long. And I had to take the say, oh, like, this is my real family is in this realm. And, but there was this thing like, oh, these here I'm known, like, I don't have to explain myself. I don't have to second guess myself. I don't have to think about is my, is my, are my words coming across in a, you know, in a way that's making sense and respect. It's like, no, like they can see through me. They know me. And when I say they, there was just like this feeling of, of a lot. Um, And some people might say like, oh, it's the presence of God. It was almost like, yes, but God and everyone, every everything, every everything in history. And there was so much love. 
you know, and, you know, we experience love on earth to the best of our ability, but here it was like, there was no, there, I, I could tell I was being seen for all my mistakes, all my, you know, trials and errors, even like shameful things. And there was no, there was no judgment. There was no criticism. There was no like, oh, like, why did you do it that way kind of thing? There was just this curiosity, like, like it, this presence wanted to know all about every little thing. And so there was this timelessness where I just kind of lingered here. And I don't remember everything that happened because I was definitely out of my body. But there was this feeling of there's so much more. This presence wants to take me and explain like the secrets of the ages and take me you know, through the galaxies and, and show me like stars forming. This presence wants to, wants to show me and explain to me things that I don't know and wants to watch me while I see those stars and just like be excited to, to see me um, taking in these, you know, mysteries of the ages. And so for me, it seemed like it could have been even like years just being outside of time and interacting with this loving presence, this feeling of home. And then all of the sudden, I realized I was upside down and I was looking at upside down trees and there was kind of like muffled sounds at first. And then it was like someone pulled out the earplugs. <laughs> and the driver was screaming there was like someone banging um a crowbar to try and get us out of the car it was like whoosh we're back and I had the biggest sense of calm and euphoria I have had in my life up up until then I felt like I had I had everything figured out now. <laughs> it's like, I don't have any more questions. This is, this is reality. Uh, I was just home and I'm, I'm going to be going back there and I've been there a million times. So like, it doesn't really matter about any of this. And I <laughs> couldn't wait to tell everyone. <laughs> so I'm, I'm there and there's people freaking out. And um, then there's like, you know, fire trucks and ambulances and all this stuff happening. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just, basking in this 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 love that I I I felt and uh and I felt like I wanted to calm everybody else down so that's that's what happened on the day of the accident thank you for sharing it with us when you first were there and you didn't have any anxiety do you feel like you were separated from your mind Yes, I would say that like on a scale of one to 10, one being like totally in the mind and 10 having no connection to it, I was at a 10 and I've never experienced anything like that before. Do you now believe that the mind is just a product of being here? Yes, the mind, in my experience, in my opinion, the mind is part, is part of our earth experience and, you know, it contains a lot of good and a lot of bad and it has its its use but when we're not here it's not required not at all it seems like it's an ambiguous thing that we talk about this because you're still thinking over there but maybe you just don't have these mind loops running unconsciously at all the time as well yeah i'm i'm curious about that over there it seemed like being aware so I'm aware of this sensation. I'm aware of that, you know, memory from eons ago. It was like the awareness could move to this, that, the other, but there wasn't a, a judgment about it or a nervousness about it. Like there was nothing attached to being aware of these different aspects. It's interesting that you mentioned emotions because I would think possibly there wouldn't be any emotions over there except for love, right? Yeah, it was just love. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, okay, this is just love. Everybody's happy and our hearts are full. It was like there was different layers and aspects of love. 
because without the mind and without this chatter and this anxiety, you could very slowly feel into these different qualities of love. So the quality of love where everyone is so excited to see you and there's that rebonding, that coming back together. The aspect of love where you're so just feeling your heart is full of gratitude for getting to be here. And so because there, there's that slowing without anxiety, you could tap into these different ways of experiencing love there. While you were there, did you completely forget about Amanda and who Amanda was? I feel like I could have retrieved that if I wanted to, but it didn't even seem like it was on the radar. It wasn't important. There was no there was no need for that there. You were talking about the presence earlier and you basically said that people asked you if it was God and you kind of said yes, but it's so much more. Do you feel that God or the presence is God plus everybody all together as one? Kind of like people say that we're all one. Yeah, that's a great question. And to skip forward to an event that happened about a year later, because there was a lot of aftermath. This happened in 2017. I was in an ayahuasca ceremony. I believe it was 2019. Yeah, actually, so it was two years later. And it was easy. I'd been in many ayahuasca ceremonies over the next couple of years. Um, and I felt it easy to leave my body in those ceremonies, probably because of the ease of leaving my body in the cracks and it helped me prepare to do that a little bit. So I was in a ceremony and I remember leaving my body and initially being in maybe a muted down version because you still have a bit of mind going on in, in those kind of spaces, a muted down version of that black space, kind of like I was on the precipice of going back to that home space. And as I'm moving towards there, my mind started to kick in. So there was kind of like this push and pull. And I ended up kind of like going into the mind a little bit too much. And then there was some anxiety. So there's this pushing and pulling going on. And I don't know how long that went on for like maybe five or 10 minutes. And then finally, just something kicked in it was like, hey, like, remember surrender, like what you actually did in the car, you surrendered. And then that was your gateway, you know. So I'm sitting on my, you know, ceremony mattress and I just relax, lean back and just totally be like, OK, higher power, whatever. <laughs> Take me where I need to go. I can't do this myself. Too worked up. And, you know, Jeff, the most amazing thing happened when I did that within seconds. This kind of like confusing black area that I had found myself in completely dissolved in front of me. Kind of like pixelated out of the way and made way for this field of white glowing light with kind of like sparkles, kind of like when it's like snowing and the sun's hitting the snowflakes. That's what I saw first. Then as I relaxed into like where, where I now was, I saw this tower and it looked kind of like, kind of like a cone. And around the edge of it was a railing and it was, the, the railing was kind of going up like this. And no matter how high I tried to look, it just never ended. And it was, it was mesmerizing me. And I, I found myself again, outside of time. I was totally in this place, being aware of this tower. And the tower was shining, it was kind of gold, and it almost seemed like it was living. It just seemed, it had this quality of being alive. And uh, as I leaned in to look at this tower, on the edge, on this railing, was everything. There was trees growing from it, birds flying around it, every human, that's, that's ever been 
was standing on this tower and the top part of them was like recognizable, but the bottom just like melded into the tower. There were angels, there was like, like up, up at some of the higher levels that were hard for me to see, almost looked like Renaissance paintings, like at the top of, uh, you know, those cathedrals. And the cool thing about those angels that were kind of hovering up around the tower that looked like the Renaissance paintings, it wasn't like looking at a painting, they had consciousness and they were timeless. And I kind of asked myself this question, like, that, that I knew the answer to. It's like, is this God? <laughs> or is this a part of God? And it was like, yeah. And I, <laughs> I then took my awareness and I located myself standing on the tower. So I would call that now my higher self or a higher aspect of myself. And that version of myself was much more all-knowing, um, much more pure in intention, and just kind of with like, with like a glowing, glowing garments that were kind of attached to my, my body. And everyone up there had like um, symbols, glowing symbols on the surface of their body that were different from each other, kind of like tattoos, but they were holographic and they were shiny and they told the story of our lives. And um, so when you looked at someone, you didn't really recognize them by their face, although that was possible you recognize them by this energetic signature that was all over their body. And something funny happened up there. When I looked at myself, I was standing on the, the railing beside another woman that I know from earth. And her and I didn't always see eye to eye, you know, rubbed each other the wrong, wrong way mostly. And up there, we were the best of friends. We'd been friends for billions of years and we'd had earth incarnations together as you know, friends, enemies, all kinds of things. And what we were doing in that moment was glancing down at Earth, at the Earth versions of us at, at this time in history, <laughs> not seeing eye to eye. And we thought it was so funny. We were just giggling and laughing and it was just, it was like entertaining us. And so in the ceremony, <laughs> I remember grabbing my pillow and giggling into my pillow because I also thought it was hilarious. And I don't know how long this lasted, but I just watched. And it was like, this was like a perpetual movement, growth, creative thing that was probably the most that my nervous system and my consciousness could take in at that point in time of, of what I would call oneness. Was that experience just as real as your NDE? Yes. Not until I got through that initial black phase, though. There was no mind going on up there. Why did you start going to ayahuasca ceremonies? Were you trying to get back to the other side? No, I actually didn't know much about ayahuasca. It was very strange. I had watched a documentary about it uh, maybe a year before my car accident. And that documentary was only talking about using ayahuasca and plant medicines as a, as a modality to help people who have addictions and severe childhood trauma. And I, when I watched that documentary, nothing resonated with me that that would be something that I would ever do, but I did find it interesting. Then um, a few months after my car accident, I was invited to a meditation retreat. I'd never been on a retreat before, but I thought that that would be a great way to um, to help integrate what had happened in my car accident. So I went to this retreat and I didn't know anybody, but the facilitator was like a very, a very lovely woman with a, a really strong but soft presence. And I remember her just looking at me when she first met me and she just smiled. It was just, it was, and it was one of these smiles where it's like, I see you like, and I'm happy you're here. And it was, yeah, people don't usually look at each other like that. So we did the retreat for three days. And then on the last day, um, I was taking a walk with her. We were just talking and suddenly this car pulled up to the retreat property and she looked at me and she said, hold on, Amanda, I need to see that person. 
And I've never seen anyone run so fast. She ran across the property to this car and gave this person a hug. And then they talked for a bit before she came back. And I said, who is that? Like her reaction to seeing this woman was like very powerful. And she said, oh, that's um, that's my ayahuasca facilitator. I've, I've been working with her to uh, support um, participants at her retreats. And there was something that clicked in me there. I thought, whatever these people have going on, this is what I, I, I need to have more of in my life. It was all energetic. You mentioned that the presence was showing you around and giving you information. Do you feel like the presence was doing that to remind you where you're from or teaching you about you know, the universe and things? At first, it was to remind me because there was a huge, there was obviously, I discovered very fast, there was a huge forgetfulness. So before I could be shown anything that was kind of of any magnitude, I I first needed kind of to adjust to, to that. And so there was like a, a slow kind of showing me of at first kind of like galaxies. And then I think once, once it was um, kind of established that I, I, I could have, sorry, that I, I had shifted over <laughs> back into there, then there was more of a, a teaching aspect. And there didn't need, there didn't need to have any like words in talking. It was like they could show me something, it could show me something or something could appear to me. And there was information contained in that, in, in what I was seeing. And I didn't need to ask any questions because it made sense somehow. It made sense either, either I knew it from before um, or I knew it and I had forgotten and I was relearning it, but it was more a showing than any kind of, there's no talking. Did you get any sense of what the whole point of coming to earth is for? Yeah. I do believe that people come here for different reasons, but I did get a sense of why I was here. And you got to realize prior to this, I was not somebody that was super involved in, you know, esoterica, um, any of these kind of like phenomenons. I mean, I was like pretty, pretty normal lifestyle. You'd say I was a normie, you know. So once I was up there and I started to be shown different things, and then integrating what I was shown when I came back, I got the sense <laughs> and this sounds funny. No one's ever asked me this question. So <laughs> I hope I explain this properly. It sounds funny that I'm, I and many of us are part of multi generational. And when I say multi generational, I mean eons of explorers, travelers, creators, all in one. <laughs> there are different families or different tribes. And we're part of God and we can change form depending on what planet or what reality we're choosing to experience. And we have different abilities and awarenesses based on those things, it changes. But earth is one of the places that my ancient family, my ancient star lineage, I guess you could say, um, has a lot of projects, has a lot of a lot of multi-generational um, learning that we do as well as we one thing that I remembered by being with with the presence and with some of these kind of like forms that were family members is that some of us especially some of us who get to have some of these experiences are here to remember for ourselves but also to remember for other people who may have been, have forgotten a little bit more so. Um, 
there always has to be, you know, a certain amount of people on earth who, who are not, who are not going to get so lost in, in the material world and in destruction to kind of hold that, hold that knowing, hold that energy, hold that place. So that's one thing that I feel like earth is for, for me. Another thing is, is learning, growing, being a student of being here. And, you know, as a young person, you know, oh, you know, you're talking, oh, we're going to change the world and like all this kind of stuff. I got more of a sense that we're here, some of us, for the world to change us. You know, like the world has a lot of very difficult aspects here. And we need to obviously address those as we can and take actions. But at the same time, allow those very dense, difficult things to change and teach us and reflect back to us things that are off in our life. So, so to be here to remember and, and remind others that can't remember as well as be transformed by what's here because it's very rich what's contained here to change our soul. Do you think that your NDE was an accident or you went back because you needed like a tune-up or something? I'm, I'm certain I went back because I needed a tune-up. Um, I got a picture in my mind very soon after the accident, I woke up in the morning, I was still kind of half asleep, half awake. And I saw from like, um, a bird's eye view, the scene of the accident. And I saw what looked like a hand, a massive hand in front of the car, preventing it from going all the way over the edge. It was just a flash picture. And then I, I kind of woke up and went about my day. So I don't believe it was an accident. I believe that it was it was time for me to step up my life in many ways. And I was going to require a massive shakeup in order for that to happen because most of us are not going to just like one day just wake up and change everything. Do you feel like you have a new purpose in life now? And if so, what is it? You know, Jeff, I'm still I'm still working with that. I always thought that when people would have experiences like this, they would be able to, you know, like within a six months or a year, like figure out what they're going to do and just like pick up and move on. And for me, it didn't happen like that. For me, I, I had like a breadcrumb trail. So at first, you know, like I came back from the, car accident and it was like I had been gone for years even though it was seconds no one noticed this around me at first but I felt like a different person I felt like I was me but me with a lot more sudden awareness um in every way even something little like I'd walk in my house I'd be like wow like there's a lot of dust in that corner (laughs) never noticed that that's just a, a funny example But I started to immediately feel like my nervous system and my body was like a radar for what was and wasn't uh, good to have as part of my life. So immediately certain relationships that I was in, I realized where I was um, giving my power away or being a doormat or people pleaser. And I, I became, even though I loved those people and had maybe years in connection with them, I became extremely uncomfortable in my way of being around them. I couldn't, I couldn't do what I used to do. Um, Stuff like material world stuff started to feel very heavy. So like I I owned a house, I had like, you know, everything that is in a normal house. And I started to get very overwhelmed with the upkeep of the house. It wasn't like I couldn't do it, but I was like, why am I doing this? Like, this is heavy. Um, And so in the next six months to a year, I shifted out of a lot of relationships, including my, you know, like the partner that I was with, it was just, it was just not working for for me anymore. And I sold my house. Um, I sold pretty much everything that I owned, gave it away, whatever. 
I sold my car. Um, until now, like I just live out of like a suitcase. Like I, I literally don't, I don't have any stuff. And so it was like a breadcrumb trail where it was too much to change everything and find a new purpose overnight. But what I could do was follow the trail. And so I noticed that once I would make one shift out of what was no longer serving me and that would settle and I would learn how to kind of be away from it and whatever, then something new would come along, a new opportunity or a new invitation to drop another attachment. And so for me, a lot of this has been like an internal world thing. So it happened in 2017. We're in 2022. Yeah. It's been five years of, of a lot, a lot of internal shifts so far. Have you noticed that you have any other new abilities that you didn't have prior? Yeah. And they're not, uh, at this point, like they're not super refined. It's not like I can just call them up all the time, but spontaneously, a lot of interesting things, um, started happening and not right away. These things often would happen when at intervals where I'd cleared out junk from my life. And then it, it was almost like that gave way for some cool things to start happening. Um, and sometimes they're just strange things. Like, um, for example, a couple months ago, I had a dream about my brother and his partner and that they were in a nightclub with me and we we're having the greatest of times. And I don't talk to him too often, you know, like, I don't know what he's up to. And this was like a Sunday night when people don't normally go to nightclubs. And it was so vivid. It was not just like a night dream. It was like, I was like relocating to a, a nightclub. And I ended up calling him the next day and he gets, you know, um, this call from me. And he, I'm like, hey, I'm like, I had this dream last night. It was so vivid. And he's like, well, that's funny because we, <laughs> he said, the two of us took a last minute trip to Puerto Vallarta and we went to a nightclub last night and there was this woman dancing there. And we couldn't stop watching her because she looked just like you. And <laughs> so these kind of like very bizarre, like, I don't know why they happen, uh, but they're always very cool when they do. So the dream world really opened up for me. A lot of times now my dreams will be 90%, you know, like typical dreams, sometimes cool, sometimes confusing, but the 10% of them are, are switching to being somewhere else. Um, another cool place that I've gone a couple of times is this room where the wall is like a hundred TV sets. And I, 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 it feels very impersonal. Like, like I'm Amanda, but I'm not really like with all Amanda's attachments and hangups. I'm just like pure awareness standing, looking at these TVs and every TV set has like a different scene of my life. It's outside of time, but each of these TV sets is like, I can just kind of focus in on one and I could jump into it if I wanted to, to re-experience that. And I can study it. I can study my, so it's like stepping outside of time. So time for me is very fluid. Like when I'm awake and I'm alert in the day, it's like anybody else. But when I go into that dream world, it's like stepping aside. I've had times where I've, this one is kind of weird where I've lived like years of a life. It, I've gone somewhere else at night, totally forgotten about earth, had a whole life somewhere else, lived, died, everything, and then woke up and it was only two hours of a meditation. So the concept of time is, has really changed for me. Also like strange premonitions happen. I was out for a jog, um, I guess this was in the fall. I was out jogging and, um, you know, I've never had any problems with people in the area. It's like kind of like country road. And I'm kind of like in a meditative state, but I'm jogging. And in my mind, in my third eye, I see this picture of someone on a bicycle coming up behind me and trying to slap my butt. And so I kind of like came out of my, you know, my headphone world. And I turned around with my hand, like, and I came contact with a bicycle and I pushed him out of the way. And 
I didn't know there was a bicycle behind me, but there's this like communication with my intuition that protected me from that guy. He got angry because I pushed his bike over, gave me the finger and he was trying, he, he was right, right in my space. He was trying to hit my butt. So, I mean, those are some little examples, but you know, I could go on and on about these kind of knowingnesses, very, very clear knowings. Have you told your family and friends about this experience? And if so, how did they react? Yeah. I told my family about it. Um, and I got different reactions from different people. Like some people would listen and believe that that was true for me, but have no reference point, but still be respectful. Other people who are maybe more in like the mainstream um, church world, to them, I think they didn't say anything outright, but reading between the lines, it wasn't it wasn't landing quite in acceptance. It seemed to be that maybe they thought that I'm like spiritually lost because it's not my experience doesn't line up with you know the church's dogma. And my friends have been mostly supportive. And again, maybe not having reference points, but knowing that it was very real for me, knowing that there was obviously something real that happened based on the, the aftermath of my life. What inspires you about your experience? I, number one, I'm not afraid of dying. I have no problem talking about the topic of death. So that in itself is very very freeing. And the second thing is I got very much expired, inspired to start living. Like before my accident, you know, I had, a, I had my career, I had my kind of like my hiking routine, you know, a very typical life, Western world life. And after I got very inspired to start doing things that I wanted to do because I realized, oh, there's not going to be a perfect time. Like, you know, another weird event could happen and I really do die. And then I never would have tried this, taken that risk, you know, um, gone for this experience. And so I started to like really get busy with, with things afterwards. So I was inspired to start living a little bit more alongside my, my dreams. And I also got inspired to share with anyone who wants to listen about some of these experiences out of body in order to, you know, bring some hope. I mean, not everybody wants to listen to content like this, but there are a lot of people who do. And I felt inspired to share where it was appropriate. If there's one message that you think humanity needs to hear about your experience, what would it be? This material world that we live in and enjoy or suffer through <laughs> it's 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 a very it's a very short it's going to be after we're not here it's going to be like waking up from a dream so if you're taking things you know very seriously to re to to realize just how temporary this experience actually is in the whole scheme of the eons and to know that the real you outside of all of these anxieties and tensions and sufferings, the real you is up there on that tower, you know, throughout eternity, that is who you are and where you belong. And you are connected to everything else that has goodness. But then down here, we, we forget a lot and and not just to not believe that this is it. Have you had any spiritual experiences before this NDE? Yeah. And it's interesting because most of my adult life, I didn't remember the spiritual experiences that I had as a young child. Those memories some, somehow were blocked for most of my life until the ayahuasca ceremonies they all came back early in my life now i remember these quite clearly 
starting at maybe age three. Yeah, about age three. I could see things in what I would now call the spirit world, as well as things in the material world. But because that's all I ever knew, I just thought that everybody saw those things. I actually didn't really talk about them because for the most part, I just thought this is life. This is part of life to see a tree or see some kind of a spirit. But it wasn't always benevolent. Um, for me, I would usually see these things at night. So I would wake up a lot in the night as a little kid. Sometimes I would wet the bed. Um, I would have nightmares, what, you know, what I called nightmares back then. But now I realize that those types of dreams that I was having at that time were visits to different realms in the spirit world. And what would happen regularly is I would have a dream where there was a being of some sort. <clears throat> and then I would wake up from my dream and see that spirit in my room. So I could like see my room when I was awake, but it was still there. And it would usually stay for, you know, up to about 20 or 30 seconds, more or less. Um, and often they were, you know, they were frightening beings. And they, you know, I, I, I had a lot of trauma around this, which is why I realized I blocked all this out. There was one that I saw, I remember now vividly, where I was in bed, I woke up, I could see it, and I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And it was between me and the bathroom. And I felt safer to wet my bed <laughs> than, than to try and like dart past this thing to the bath. This is how real we're talking, you know? And when I told my parents, you know, they're like, oh, you know, everyone has nightmares or whatever. And I realized right then and there that this was not landing. My support system was not capable to um, support this. And so, this is actually a lot of the healing work that I did with ayahuasca later was to kind of like make some sense of back then because it ended up being a childhood that contained a lot of fear, a lot of terror of um, being seeing beings like this. It wasn't always like this. One time I woke up and there was like this outline, kind of like a glowing outline of Jesus on the end of my bed. And because I was mostly frightened and a neurotic child, um, this was the most calming thing I had ever seen. I think I was four. And he was there for, I don't know, maybe like 20 or 30 seconds before I was like fully back in my body and I lost contact. But this is why, because of that, now we did go to church and all that kind of thing. But this is why I resonate with the being of Jesus because of this event and around that time you know being a, a church family my parents I remember them calling them, me into their room and saying okay like you need to ask Jesus into your heart you know and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking they were talking the way they were talking about him at the time was like he was like far far away we'd have to call him in you know it, it seemed like oh this guy is always like he's here anyways. Like he's always available and with us. Like I didn't really understand this dogmatic prayer that they seemed like very like making sure that I prayed it so that I didn't go to hell kind of thing. And so, you know, in my upbringing, there was a lot of talk about hell, a lot of talk about demons, Satan. I remember even like images, paintings, like medieval paintings would frighten me beyond. Like I would feel energy from some of those kind of images as a young child. And then when I was about four, maybe five, I stopped actually seeing um, these, you know, scary things, but I could still feel them. And that followed me up until like maybe when I was like eight or nine, um, I could feel presences in certain places. Like if I was in an old house, I remember certain old houses, certain rooms, I just wouldn't go in. There was, there's too much 
uh, of some type of energy present in those rooms. And sometimes in the forest, I would feel presences, but they weren't ominous. They were just kind of like intense. Um, probably looking back, they were, you know, elemental, elemental spirits. Um, but I, I knew if we were in a part of the forest where they were or where they weren't. And I didn't talk about any of this to anyone. And this was, um, yeah, this created a lot of trauma for me and probably attracted a lot of just negative energy in general towards my field, because I was always kind of like in this nervous mode trying to deal with all this. Do you feel now that you could resume communication with those beings like the elementals? Yeah, for sure. Um, that's something that that the ayahuasca ceremonies helped me a lot with. And I think it was partly by transmission from the people that were facilitating the ceremonies and seeing how they were able to collaborate and be supported for healing for the group by the gifts of these beings. And they were doing that with ease and with respect and with reciprocity. And that's something that obviously I didn't have access to as a young child. And so now, even though I'm not totally, totally in that world all the time, you know, some people are able to do that. Those presences, I, I still do sense from time to time. They still do bring kind of like a, a jolt. I, I'll be honest, they do bring a jolt to my nervous system because the amount of energy that's contained, and I, I feel like you probably know what I'm saying, the amount of energy that can be contained in some of those beings is very potent. And I even liken it to like, you know, in the Bible, a lot of times when it talks about angels visiting people in the Bible, it always says they're completely terrified and frightened. <laughs> you know, we have all these pictures of these beautiful angels floating around. Not necessarily. It's very frightening. Like I, I was in Mexico. Um, this is a good example of that. I was in Mexico last year and I was in a Yucatan and I woke up in the middle of the night one night. My heart was just racing suddenly out of the blue. What is this? I'm not alone in my room. There was like, I was like, just had this feeling like there was like something in my room and I was initially frightened. And then I was like, relax, you know, surrender into to my bed and be like, okay, I'm curious who's here. And I could see in my third eye, these really tall, look like Easter Island stone, stone kind of people, but they had consciousness. Like, you know, when you see Mayan statues, it's a Mayan statue. This looked like Mayan statues, but they were people. And they were like, we're the Toltecs. And this is our land. And I was like, whoa, like these are the guardians of the Yucatan <laughs> and we're in my bedroom. And they weren't like, they were just making their presence known. And I felt very supported by them. And so I feel like sometimes people in the Western world can, especially children, can have contact with the spirit world. And if there's not, they're not supported to understand that energy, it can be very overwhelming. One thing that I like hearing about your story is about surrender. And it's a common theme that I've heard through different guests that when you finally surrender, a lot of times you end up having an NDE. Yeah. I believe that we've had many lives. And I also believe that for me personally, surrendering into death is something that I've been trained to do in other lives. Um, the way that my partner who was driving the car reacted to that accident was very different from me. And so I don't think that I have some kind of special ability to surrender. I feel like I've literally trained off planet for that or, or done it before. Um, but surrender was not something that I utilized very much up until then. It's kind of like it came back. And in my day-to-day -day life now, it's actually part of my practice. Like people talk, oh, I have a yoga practice. I have a whatever. I have a surrender practice. Because I, when I was talking about my body being kind of like a meter <laughs> for what to do or what not to do or whatever, now, if I resist and I don't surrender to the reality of a situation or a disappointment, the resistance is actually painful and makes me feel sick when I'm, so it's not that I don't resist. It's that I always do. I feel absolutely disgusting. And then I remember, oh, the answer to this is to, to surrender and let go. 
And then I, I have to, and a lot of it's in the body, you know, at first it's in the mind and then quickly it's in the body where you're like rigid, your heart is racing, you know, you may be tensing your muscles. So I, I have to start with the body, really like slow the body and relax my muscles, maybe slow my breathing or whatever. And then my mind will stop. And then, um, so surrender is actually like my main, I would say my main spiritual practice. It's not very sexy spiritual practice, like, but it's, it's what's working. <laughs> Do you have any memories of being on other planets? I don't have clear memories of being on other planets. However, I do have memories of being part of, how do I say this? A group, like I was talking about um, soul groups that travel throughout the eons that I could trace back to Sirius possibly prior, but Sirius was my only reference point when I, when I could see them in my third eye and they looked kind of Merlin like, and by the way, I don't have any connection to like fantasy movies, wizards, like I'm just some normal woman. But, um, when I look at them, they look like Merlin. They have like long beards, long Navy clothing with like gold moon and stars on them, staffs, with like a crystal on top. The women have very long hair, like they're natural looking, but there's a real cosmic kind of wizardry element. They know magic. I'll tell you that they know old magic. And when I say old magic, I don't know if you have had, you know, in any of your personal experiences where you're outside of time and you realize just how ancient we, we are. Like it's, it can't even be put to words, you know? Before Earth, for sure, before Earth was um, inhabited, uh, I was part of this group on Sirius, and they still exist outside of time. And I also exist with them outside of time. Part of my higher self is is there watching, you know, watching how things are going on, like watching my version of me there. Um, and there's a connection from that Sirius group with Atlantis that I'm not a hundred percent sure of because I just get pictures. I'm still putting it together, but I was in an ayahuasca ceremony the following night from the night of that tower, golden tower, where there was an actual storm um, going on outside with lightning. And the lightning was like, what I could see was actually different colors. I've never seen multicolored lightning, but there was actually multicolored lightning. And then my friend, um, my friend who was not in the ceremony, she called me three days later and she's like, Oh, Hey, that storm the other night, like, did you see the lightning was changing color? So it wasn't, it wasn't part of the ayahuasca. It was like really happening. Okay. And when that was happening, I, I was transported to a scene that I remember, but I didn't want to remember. And this was, um, the same people, the same like serious group were incarnated again, but at a different time here on earth as earth beings. And we were watching, um, the last moments of Atlantis. And it looked like a lot of, uh, purple, silver, dark blue, kind of like mists going on spires. There were like some flying machines, but what was really difficult about that Atlantis scene was people were just throwing magic. They were they were able to use their words. There was a knowledge on earth at the time of using words in different combinations, like different mathematical um, combinations of saying things, syllables or whatever, to send energy, to cause changes in the environment, to harm people, whatever. And it had gotten totally out of control. There was technology um, also involved. Um, I don't know exactly what technology, I know crystals were part of it, but there was a lot more. And I felt like in that lifetime, I was seeing the, I was seeing the repercussions of misuse of technology, um, but starting with intent, starting with coming only from the mind and not the heart. And at first I didn't understand why I was seeing it other than 
kind of like this clearing from my my own kind of like karmic memory. But now I look at it as there's a lot of that going on now. Like there are some aspects that we are reliving on this planet of using technology only from the mind and not the heart. And, you know, there's the potential of, of that repeating itself, what happened there in Atlantis. So this group, this soul group from Sirius, that that's as far back as I could remember, this family of mine, um, has incarnated in many cycles, incarnated in Atlantis, um, in Egypt, in, in times where I learned about Jewish mysticism or perhaps was like a Jewish mystic. Um, and we're back again now. And there's many of us. And if what I'm saying resonates with you, you're probably connected to it. And um, I even looked around that ceremony room and I, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> some of you guys, like we've been doing this for a long time. If people want to reach out to you, are you up for that? And if so, how can they reach you? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel that I just started last week. So there's not a ton of content on there, but I'm going to put my, I'll put my email address on there, um, on the about, on the about section. And, you know, I, right now I'm studying to become a certified trauma coach. I'm not finished, but I'm going to go for my ICF certification next year. And, you know, I'm, I'm open. If someone is feeling stuck or frightened or challenged on any of these things that we talked about tonight, and I could be of any, you know, um, support, I'd be happy to, to talk on email. Um, yeah, because they're, they're weird topics. Sometimes you can feel really alone. What's the name of your channel? Uh, it's at Lion Spirit 1111. I'll put a link to it in the description. All right, Amanda, before we finish up, can you give us one more positive message? Yeah, don't wait. Don't wait to do the things that are on your heart that you're inspired to do because the day might never come. Get going now, even if it's even if it's one move you can make towards your dream, if it's like a making a reservation, making a deposit, telling someone else that you're going to be doing it. Just make that one move and start going and and spirit will help move you forward. Just show, just show that you're going to do it because you don't know when your last day is going to be. Thank you for that message. And Amanda, thank you for being my guest. My pleasure. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.